Good morning, my dear brothers and sisters. How are you today? Good. So we greet each other. Good morning. We recognize, uh, recognize your seatmates. Wave, say hello, smile. Because there should be no divide, no chasm between you and your seatmates. I also would like to introduce to you our new priest. He will be assigned here as parochial vicar. And yes, he will be the third priest. Uh, his name is Father Philip. So for more than one year, it was only me and Father Mike who were doing all the work here, and it was just too much for two priests. So, and it was hard for us to get another priest. So make sure that you welcome him, that you love him, and that you show your support to him. But also today, we are doing a fellowship and a welcome, um, welcome fellowship with, for our um, new parishioners. Uh, you know, we have recognized that we have not been doing anything to welcome our new parishioners. So after this Mass in the hall, we shall be welcoming them and doing some fellowship with them. We invited them to come here to this Mass. So I want to know, or even if you were not invited, because uh, nobody called you, but I want to know who amongst here are new in the parish and new in the area. Would you, would you please stand? I none. <laughs> none. But welcome. <laughs> Maybe you're just ashamed, but welcome. And we want to do that regularly to welcome new parishioners um, in the area. There was once a father who every night would talk to his young son before going to bed. And every night, the young son would say his prayers before he falls asleep. One night, the young son began his prayer, and he said, now I, lay down, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should wake before I die, oops, sorry, Dad, I got that backwards. And the father, in his wisdom, said, Oh, no, my son, it would be my greatest hope for you that you would be awake before you die. Tragically, I think, there are a lot of people who spend most of their life asleep and not awake. They make their way through their days and weeks and months and years, often very unaware of so much that's going on around them. And if they do realize that what, what's, what's happening, it's often in a moment of crisis, in a moment of shock, and very often a moment that's almost too late. As, a, as an example of that, we have Amos the prophet in our first reading today. The moral issue that Amos is talking about is really not sinful behavior, but he is talking about complacency. Woe to the complacence in Zion, lying upon beds of ivory, stretch comfortably on their couches. They eat lambs from, taken from the flock and calves from the stall. Improvising to the music of the harp, they devise their own accompaniment. They drink wine from bowls and anoint themselves with the best oils. Mind, of you, mind you, none of this is in and of itself sinful. None of these is in and of itself necessarily wrong. The problem that Amos points out is that they have, in their luxury, become numbed to the direction their country they're heading in, to the tragedy that is about to befall them. And they miss the bigger picture because they were so concerned about themselves. They were asleep to what was going on, they were not awake to it. And true enough, the prophecy was fulfilled when a southern kingdom, Judah, with its capital, Jerusalem, was raised to the ground in 587 BC by the army of the Babylonian king, Nebuchadnezzar. 
and its elite rich, they were led to a humiliating and punishing exile in Babylon. The parable that Jesus gives us today is essentially the same thing. I don't think the rich man did anything wrong, nor did he commit any crime. But he was not innocent either. Somehow, in the midst of his luxury and his sumptuous dining with his purple robe, he was not awake. He was asleep to the guy that's, that was right there in front of him every day who could have used his help. And that's a problem. That's an issue. In the Catholic teaching, we call this the sin of omission. The sin of not doing what one is supposed to do, especially the obligation of justice and charity. The fathers of the church find three culpable omissions in the rich man in the parable. First, he neglected the poor beggar at his door by not helping him to treat his illness or giving him a small space to live in. Second, he ignored the scrolls of sacred scriptures kept on his table reminding him of God's commandment in the book of Leviticus, don't deny help to the poor, be liberal in helping the widows and the homeless. And third, he led a life of luxury and self-indulgence, totally ignoring the poor people around him with Cain's attitude to his brother Abel, am I my brother's keeper? But don't get this gospel wrong. It is not wrong to be rich, but it is wrong to be so involved with ourselves to the point of becoming oblivious to the call of the gospel, which is, or which are, charity and justice. There is one interesting word that I find in the gospel today. I've read this gospel many times over, reflected on it, and this word never fails to catch my attention. And that word is chasm. There is a great chasm between the rich, man, the rich man and Lazarus. What is that chasm? To begin with, chasm is defined as a deep fissure in the earth or rock or another surface. But I think that, chasm, that the chasm that Jesus refer, is, uh, is referring to in the gospel today is not the literal chasm, but the rich man's inability to respond to the need of the poor man. A chasm that he himself formed all throughout his life by his lack of response to anyone in need. Yes, he had the word of God. He had all the commandments. He knew them but he never heeded them. And in the long run, it became easier for him to ignore Lazarus without feeling any guilt. And consequently, even though Lazarus was already in front, Lazarus could also no longer have an access to him because a chasm had been formed through the years. Here's how I think it works. And I'm just going to share it from an observation in the parish. And I say this with fear and trembling, but also with charity. After Mass, our Harvest Festival team members are out at exits, exit doors. While many would stop by, shake hands, receive envelopes, donate, inquire, volunteer, or just smile. But some would ignore, pretending they didn't see them, or would even go around to avoid them. So reflecting on this, I ask myself, if we can do this to a fellow St. Paul parishioner, to whom else can we do this? Would it not become easier for us to do, this, to do the same to people whom we do not know? 
to the poor, to the beggar, to anybody who has no relations with us whatsoever. And so, are we not creating a chasm between ourselves and others? And the danger is, this chasm can become bigger and deeper and bigger and deeper through the years if we get used to it. Of course, I cited this example not to make you feel guilty about not buying your tickets. No, this is not about buying tickets. No. But this is about recognizing the person in front of you, maybe saying hello, or giving a smile, or saying a simple thank you for doing this for our church or simply and politely declining, I already have tickets, thank you. Because in life, the truth is, we will not be able to help everyone, but we can surely acknowledge everyone. September 27th is the Feast of St. Vincent de Paul. In sixth century France, St. Vincent de Paul observed the disparity between the rich and the poor. As a priest, he had the opportunity to experience the aristoc aristocratic life, as well as the life of the destitute poor in Paris. And so he organized groups of women called charities who gave their time and belongings to the poor, a group which eventually became the Daughters of Charity, in which Mother Elizabeth Ann Seton was part of. Two centuries after, a 20-year-old college student, Frederick Ozenam, and five other students witnessed a dire poverty of the lower social class in Paris. They decided to dedicate themselves to the poor after the example of Vincent de Paul. In 1833, they established the Conference of Charity of St. Vincent de Paul, soon to be called the Society of St. Vincent de Paul. Frederick Ozanam was beatified by Pope John Paul II in 1997. Do you know what's the first common thing about Vincent de Paul and Frederick Ozanam? They were both changed by the gospel today. Yes, the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. After hearing this parable, they became so determined not only to bring bread, but friendship to the poor. And from that day on, they never ignored the Lazaruses at their door. Friends, be changed by the gospel, not only of today, but of the entire gospel that we call good news, so that we ourselves become good news to others. Amen.